sometimes we use the the material for different lessons and stuff. So, mm -hmm. um, so I've been uh, working on the topic of empathy. How do we build a more empathic uh, society? And I've been doing interviews. You know, just doing a lot of different projects around uh, how to create more uh, empathy in the world. And I've, I'm here in El Cerrito, which is near Berkeley, so in the San Francisco Bay Area. And that's just a quick uh, intro if we just go around just to kind of get the ball rolling, just introduce ourselves. And um, Demetra, if you'd like to go next. Oh, okay. Uh, um, I'm located in Greece. I have traveled and lived in a number of different countries. Um, my first BA is in religion, my second is in English literature and language, and now I'm working on my um, uh, MA on digital uh, means in education, and also my thesis will be in, on the role of empathy, so how empathy can be um, uh, can be used, can be part of the digital classroom. And uh, yeah, empathy is, uh, I'm extremely interested in uh, empathy because I can see that it transforms the, the classroom that can be digital or in brick and mortar. And also I can see that without empathy, we cannot build meaningful relationships with others. And so I'm very, I'm extremely interested in learning as much as possible about it. And also I'm thinking about my PhD that would be also in empathy as well, and maybe the next years. Okay, thank you, uh, Ingrid. Hi, I'm Ingrid, and I'm in Boise, Idaho. I retired about a year ago, and my profession then was um, mainly developing training, and I really didn't know very much about empathy until a few years ago, um, I don't know, maybe five years ago or so, and through not uh, taking some courses on nonviolent communication. Mm -hmm. And it, it has changed my life um, in so many ways. And I'm defi definitely a neophyte with it, um, but I try to read quite a bit. And, but that practicing, you know, I did practice some with nonviolent communication practice groups, but it's, um, as you know, an ongoing thing. And, so I'm just real excited that you're doing this with the course. I hadn't read the book before. And so I'm glad you introduced me to the book and also meeting others and the opportunity to practice. Mm, thanks. Uh, Stefan? Sure. Um, today my uh, uh, reception is uh, a bit poor. I don't know if it's my internet uh connection but can you hear me okay we do sometimes you break up a little bit but it seems to be okay uh spoke okay. to you yeah uh, well <laughs> so if, you say, if, if it gets too bad we can always turn off your video and you know just have the audio that can kind of give you more bandwidth okay Okay, if not, I can try, uh, try it on my phone if it doesn't work. But anyway, uh, I'm a psychiatrist. Uh, I uh, work with adults and adolescents, and uh, I'm a, a director of education uh, for, for, and teach uh, psychiatry residents, uh, other residents, and uh, medical students uh, in a variety of different areas. And uh, I, I, I happen to see this online and just happen to work out uh, uh, well and uh, I'm happy to be a part of this uh, group and you know as the as, as the preface says to this uh, uh, book of uh, 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 there's no relationship between years of education and the ability to use these skills so I I don't think I, I don't uh, uh, portray or wish to portray my as being any more uh, skilled than anyone else. I was looking for some a very simple, um, uh, easy to easy um, way to teach these skills to students and residents, and I thought uh, I thought that this would be a good start. A hundred page book, uh, and uh, maybe we'll uh, all maybe at least uh, uh, some part of us will be incorporated into perhaps. Uh, 
teaching the residents uh, some sometime mm. later this year. Mm, that would be great. Yeah, that would, that would be exciting. Uh, so they, what I was thinking of doing today is uh, is we start our our introduction. So we just we go into an introductory discussion, you know, about why we want to develop this training, and we've already talked about it a bit, but we would, you know, just have a sort of a free discussion for maybe. 20, 30 minutes to kind of discuss the overall project. And then I would introduce the uh, empathy circle process. And I've got a little uh, guide how to do that. And that's like the core process that we're using uh, for practicing empathic listening. And we have that as that kind of the core. We keep uh, building uh, on it. And then we would use the empathic listening uh, process to uh, discuss the project as well as to go into uh, discussing the preface and maybe we'd even get to chapter one as well. So that was the, and this is going to be just a simple, you know, kind of introduction. As we go through the different meetings, there'll, there'll be kind of more and more stuff kind of layered on different activities and intention setting and all kinds of uh, stuff, but I want to keep it just fairly simple and uh, to, to begin with. Uh, unfortunately, Andrea couldn't make it. She had uh, uh, she's working on her PhD, as I mentioned, as well on on empathy and as, is really into curriculum design. And this uh, meeting time, she thought she could meet, uh, but it, the next two meetings she couldn't. So she might be joining us in two weeks, uh, and I'm not. We'll see how that goes. Um, so with that. Uh, oh, is there any questions about that, or does, how does that sound? Does that work for everybody? General, okay. Then, <clears throat> so we could, with our other groups, so this is our design team three, so what we've been doing at each meeting is we, we have this question, at least we have actually two questions, which is just a general question about, you know, why are you interested in the project? Maybe thoughts about empathy, just kind of a general ex uh, topic. And then we have a specific chapter uh, question that we write on when we arrive. And, you know, some people come a little early, some come a little bit late. So we have used that time to kind of be writing uh, in writing this and then we go around and share it. So we can uh, start with the sharing uh, our uh, the the what we wrote and or you know even just talk about it like you know why are you interested in even working on this and you know we've talked a little bit about it um, so I'll I'll start and kind of model it and so as I as I was saying that uh, you know I've been working on empathy you know for quite a while and I've really kind of st I tried have tried to create some trainings that kind of like fell apart is that my brain is not very kind of logical, like, you know, for curriculum development. So I'm glad there's some trainers here. I mean, <laughs> educators here. So I, I can, I have a very divergent kind of way of thinking, but it brings, I think, a lot of cl uh, creativity. And so um, I, I've been seeing the, the real need for a, an empathy training out there. And there's a lot of different trainings like NBC and so forth, but there isn't one that's uh, really, I think, really good. I mean, a really high quality, you know, kind of an introductory training. And uh, so that's what I think is, is needed. So I just see that there's a real need for that and something that's very easily accessible. That's sort of a gateway to going in a lot of different directions and, um, so, uh, that's, and then with this book, uh, listening, well, I just found that it created a, an easy structure. It was a simple, easy structure that kind of helped my mind <laughs> kind of focus and get kind of organized. So, uh, so that's kind of, um, you know, why I've started putting these groups together and, uh, it's been working fairly well. You know, I'm pretty excited, and I'm excited about the people who have come together uh, to work on this. And uh, you know, there's a lot of empathy enthusiasts out there. Everything from uh, designers to curriculum developers to you know academics to uh, psychiatrists to uh, you know people who have been doing NBC and a lot of other types of uh, empathy training. So. Um, so I really see also that, that, that this can kind of be 
uh, there's also a sort of a need for an empathy activist training. So I've been very active in sort of a, an activist empathy. We have this empathy tent that we've been uh, setting up in conflict situations. So some of these knock down, drag out street fights that have been happening like in Berkeley where the political left and right get together. We've been there with the empathy tent. We've been offering listening. Uh, we've been talking with uh, you know, the far right, you know, folks like Identity Europa, who are the folks that were at uh, Charlottesville. Uh, if you know, uh, Dimitra, if you know Charlottesville, it was, uh, they came there and there was some real, you know, some real battles that took place there. Uh, and we actually sat down with them and do empathic listening with them. So we've, we've held uh, forums, uh, a radical empathy forum with local politicians where we do empathic listening uh, with them. And so we have a lot of different projects like that. And I just see that uh, training, we need sort of a good training it's easily accessible online to you know make this material more accessible so that's kind of a um, little bit of uh, where I am and the last thing I just saw there is too is sort of a create a training that people who have done it that they can also train the trainers and we can it can be sort of an income something that helps sustain an empathy building movement so that's another component I'm looking at so so that's a little bit about me my interest um, you know, Ingrid, would you like to kind of share your talk? Oh, it was actually Demetra. If we just go down the list, Demetra, you're next on the on the writing here. Oops. Uh, are you muted or not hearing you? Huh, your voice stopped. Mm -hmm. Oh, my voice. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. Uh, no, I guess you have to hold it really close because it's. Oh, yeah. So it's my turn to speak. Yeah, if you, uh, if you would speak. <clears throat> um, okay, actually, all my interest in empathy started when I realized that many people many people in my life didn't have empathy and I I saw that this destroyed their lives. So without empathy, they couldn't create meaningful relationships. They, uh, they felt empty and they ended up being depressed. So this really shocked me. I wanted to realize what was wrong with them because there were people I really loved and something was wrong. They couldn't be easily connected to others. And I realized that it was their inability to, be, to feel for the other, to be honest, and to give priority to the needs of the other person, not being uh, egocentric. So I started, I started observing people around me. I started uh, uh, to read and to watch documentaries. I've done with therapists. I mean, I really want to learn more about that. That was on a professional, uh, on a personal level, but also as a student. Even though I, I really wanted to read. I really read a lot, but I never liked school and I couldn't realize what was wrong. But later on, when I grew up, I realized that there was the, the way people used to, teachers used to teach, had something that annoyed me as a kid, but I didn't know what was that. So later on, I realized that the problem was that they were very formative and they didn't feel for the students. So they, they blocked, they used to block the, um, uh, the open communication between teachers and students. And when, when students realized that the teacher didn't care about them, then they, didn't, they were not willing to show real interest. Mm -hmm. So that was another thing that made me realize that as a, as a teacher, when I decided to become a teacher, a language teacher, mm -hmm. that I should always have in my mind. And uh, I realized that this made a difference and my students could uh, improve their language skills and, be, and love English. Probably because of the way, being a language teacher is not just a, a rare profession. You can find so many, but there was something that made a difference. And people told me that my empathy was what really attracted them. And then I realized I wanted to study more and I wanted to have my MA thesis and my PhD later on. I hope that I have, can have my PhD in the States. Um, uh, I can uh, I can uh, study 
even more closely the relations between empathy in a digital world where people seem to become more and more distant from each other because they have a virtual social life. And uh, I really wanted to do something about it. It's not only about me studying empathy, but I really want to take some social action in the sense that I can improve the situation for other people because I'm, I don't love just theory. Theory is good as long as it uh, supports action. So it's the precondition for me. Um, uh, I think this is uh, uh, this is all more or less. Oh, and also another thing was that my first studies uh, are in religion. So there, uh, after studying Christianity for many years, I realized that um, that when you give priority to the other person, this is what makes a whole difference. So when I see people saying all the time, I don't have time for you. Oh, this is not my problem. Oh, I don't care about that. I care only about my life. And these are statements that really don't express my view in life. And I said, oh, I think that this doesn't really make people happy. Of course, we have to protect our emotional self, but being givers doesn't mean that we 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 waste ourselves there is just some balance we can uh, we can keep in our life so i can care about you and also i can care about me so you know everybody can be satisfied that's it <laughs> uh, thanks uh stefan you're next on the list here we're just going down a list um sure i i think i echo um you know some of what uh you guys uh, said um, empathy um, <clears throat> allows um, for uh, growth. Um, I think people like Carl Rogers and uh, other uh, in 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 this in the psychodynamic. Uh, Psychoanalytic uh, literature. There was uh, there was some there were some folks who uh, were very interested in uh, empathy, and uh, uh, they felt that uh, like Carl Rogers and I and I, I feel this way too that uh, the the process of uh, carefully listening and uh, Getting another person um, allows another person to uh, open up and uh, be more vulnerable, and uh, ultimately uh, to uh, to grow because uh, the empathy allows people to uh, be open to their own failings and to kind of acknowledge them at the outset, um, you know, as they think about, uh, uh, you know, as they think about changing something. So you're saying it is a way of growing, is a kind of a force for growth? Yes, it's, 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 it's a force for growth, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Um, you know, in, in the psychiatric literature, uh, it's often linked to something called uh, the therapeutic alliance, and um, and uh, uh, treatment outcomes are. Uh, there was uh, back, I think, in the '90s, there was a guy named Wachtel, Wachtel or something like that, who did a large um, did a large series of studies looking at what. Uh, was important in psychotherapeutic outcomes, uh, and this is in the treatment literature, and uh, and he uh, thought it was due to these uh, common uh, factor skills, which were uh, primarily in the realm of uh, empathy and uh, you know interpersonal engagement, um, and we're still trying to figure out exactly what what it is, um, uh, you know. What what elements of empathy are uh, you know most crucial? Yeah. Okay. Is there more? Or do you feel? I could I could go on. <laughs> okay. Well, let's give Ingrid then, a ch uh, and then we'll just kind of open it up and just have a little bit of discussion before we do an empathy circle. Ingrid. 
You want to share yours? Well, my big wake-up call was I was in a NVC um, practice group, pretty new to it, and a woman was talking about a mattress she had bought and was kind of complaining about it. That really, she didn't buy it. A friend gave it to her. And in the, in the group, we were supposed to be listening to her in order to give her empathy. And my mind, just my thoughts kept judging. I just kept judging her. It's like, I can't believe she's complaining about getting a free mattress and blah, 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 blah. And I couldn't even go to empathy. Um, and it was shocking to me um, that um, it was just so much judgment. And then at least after that, I started to start seeing the judgment more come in. And I've been able to, um, not definitely not all the time, but at least with my husband, we practice, try to practice it a lot together. And um, when I see it come in, I can kind of try to stop it and give empathy. Because you can't do it. When you have the judgment, you cannot give the empathy. And, and you can't listen to them. And then also what we have found, my husband and I have found a lot, is that our defensiveness goes down a lot. When we're talking about a hot, hot topic between us, and if I'm really listening to him, trying to be empathic and then also you know, say it back to him, um, I don't get as defensive if he's saying something and I can understand it a little bit more. And it's just, it's just, um, I just can't believe it. Um, how, what a change it can make. And so I'm, I'm, uh, like a champion of it, of empathy. And, um, you know, so like with other, it's nice to be in this group cause you can talk about it. You know, I, I like to talk about it with others, but also, you know, you don't want to push it too much. So, Anyway, that's my story. Okay, then uh, what do we? So, what do you think? Of everybody think about the the whole project. You know, kind of the outline of it. Um, what, what the idea is is that uh, every meeting we will take a chapter and then uh, discuss it using empathic listening. And uh, there's a, we also have a toolkit that we're developing. So there'll be diff each act, there's various activities that we're, you know, kind of fleshing out toolkits and we'll be uh, kind of trying those out and uh, stuff like that. So just kind of, just in terms of what do you think is a really good way forward? What would you see as a, you know, kind of just hearing what everybody thinks is a good way forward for developing this uh, training? So are you talking about training i get confused a little bit with is what we're doing here part of what the the open online course would be or are we what tell me the relationship between yeah it, oh. there's kind of two parts we're sort of doing the course going through the course and then we're also designing it so we kind of have two hats that we're doing okay so we're kind of like stepping out i mean it's, it's kind of easy just to kind of go through it and do it and not be you know kind of stepping out but we're also kind of stepping out and thinking of how do we how would we create this course so we're doing we're sort of flying the plane while we build it <laughs> so it can get a little you know might get a little confusing from from that aspect but so far it's been working you know fairly well uh, once we get into it um, i know that uh, you know stefan with uh, what you're talking about, uh, what, you're, what I was hearing, what kind of one of your ideas or needs is to uh, develop a training for your students and, you know, how to incorporate it into that. Do you, what I was kind of wondering, what I kind of see that if we can even support that, I think that would be kind of uh, really, I think it would be really productive too. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, you know, not to, in the, in the treatment world, um, there's a, a psychiatric, very famous psychiatric hospital in Massachusetts called Austin Riggs, which is a uh, psychoanalytic uh, hospital. It's, uh, you have to be rich to go there. It's fifty thousand dollars a month cash. Wow. Uh, but anyway, uh, the uh, there's one of the guys there. Uh, 
uh, created this model for talking about psychotherapies, and it's called the Y model. And uh, you know, the, the two major competing psychotherapies are cognitive behavioral therapy and psychodynamic psychotherapy. And uh, with this Y model, they are the two uh, prongs. And the, 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 the base of the Y is these common factors or uh, empathy and, and reflective listening and basically building a therapeutic alliance. And those are really the, the central core to any other, uh, to, to these two major uh, uh, therapeutic paradigms of, 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 of treatment in psychotherapy. Um, and uh, what, what, what happens in, uh, in practice is, uh, well, psychiatrists, for example, and other types of psycho psychologists, there's, you know, they're, they're usually required to have some competency in uh, these different uh, psychotherapies. But, but uh, before you can do that, you have to master these uh, common factors, these basic uh, skills of empathy and such, and very little attention or, or, or training is uh, is focused uh, here because it's it's often assumed that that people already have uh, mastered these skills or you know uh, and and it's and it's just and it's just clearly isn't the case and and. Uh, you know, I mean, so I, I mean, I'm I'm kind of narrowly focusing on the treatment world, but a lot of this can be applied, you know, across the board, any anywhere else. I mean, if you're talking about very high level, um, you know, uh, C-suite uh, leaders and uh, other other uh, very intelligent folks. Um, you know, they may have a high IQ, uh, but they don't have necessarily a high EQ or what they sometimes, you know, will call emotional, uh, emotional intelligence or emotional quotient, which, which, which uh, is, which implies, uh, you know, very uh, high level empathy skills. And so, you know, regardless of, uh, you know, there's, there's a great deal of need and uh, it would be, I think it would be wonderful if there was. I, I, I have. I, I did a little searching again today. Other there's um, at Harvard. They 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 um, they started a training program. I think it's called Empathetics or something. Uh, uh, you know, which uh, you know is is for hospitals, nurses, physicians, uh, and frontline staff. Uh, uh, part of it is uh, some basic skills in empathy. Part of it is understanding the neurobiology of empathy. Uh, but, you know, there's really not, su surprisingly, you know, there's not a, um, uh, a good, solid, uh, uh, you know, curriculum out there that exists on these s so foundational, uh, you know, skills that, that often people uh, think, are, are simple and that, you know, it can be learned quickly. And, you know, in, in William Miller's, Miller's preface, he talks about that, that, you know, there is an underlying theme, there's a hundred page book and you can read the book and, you know, quickly and be done with it, you know, in a couple of hours or whatever. But that does not mean that you have developed these skills. You have to practice these skills and it's just like anything else. I mean, you, you have some uh, genetic, um, you know, predisposition towards perhaps having some, you know, uh, uh, being good at something kind of, but, but you can cert and then you can, uh, you know, hone those skills like music, like a musician would, or, or, you know, uh, any kind of skill. There's a, of course, something that you're in an, an innate aspect to it. Uh, but, uh, a lot of it requires, uh, training and diligence and it, it comp and you can develop competency in so yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what I was hearing there is that the, you see that this core part, the kind of the bottom of the why, is this basic empathic listening and you're just seeing the importance of it and it's not really taught out there. And even from doing all your searches, that there's no really good training out there that just practice, where you just practice that basic uh, foundational skill and uh, it takes practice. It's not just kind of reading about it. It takes real practice. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, exactly. That's what we're trying to develop in this training. I mean, in this online MOOC is a framework for really learning those basic uh, empathic listening skills. There's processes like NBC um, that, you know, have 
have a lot of uh, material about, you know, uh, um, about empathy. And uh, I think even NVC, it doesn't really cover that foundational aspect, in, in, at least online. There's, uh, I haven't seen, and I've been doing this for about 12, 13 years. I just haven't seen kind of the level of, uh, you know, of, of a training for that. So that's what, it, what we want to develop. And, and to design. And so the, the uh, core practice that uh, I found is what I call the empathy circle for just practicing empathic listening. And from there, this is like that basic, simple beginning using doing reflective listening. And it's what the book is about is adding different components, you know, getting deeper and deeper. Uh, learning more, you know, adding more and more insight and practices in, into that basic empathic listening. And um, so that's what um, I did want to uh, kind of just show us, uh, you know, kind of go through a little outline that I've got for that, how we do it, mm -hmm. and then we'll just start doing the empathic listening. I want a little bit of a contrast between just kind of freestyle discussion like we've been having and then we'll go into actual empathic listening so we can have kind of a kind of a different a sense of the little bit of the difference there. Um, so I guess we're ready unless uh, Demetra or Ingrid, if you had anything else to say, we can. I just have a question for mm -hmm. you. So do you do empathic listening um, all the time when in just normal everyday conversations with people or are there times when you tend to do it or, or in, or do you, you can just answer that? Yeah, I try to I tr uh, have a, a sort of a empathic awareness. So I try to be, a, you know, have that awareness. Um, and I don't always do reflective listening or empathic listening, but I try to have like a, sort of an awareness, awareness. Uh, okay. of, of okay. it. And, and there's also the, the listening as well as the speaking, right? It's like you can speak empathically and listen empathically and, you know, I need to be learning more about this, all those skills myself too. It's just an ongoing, you know, it's, it's like the practice. You're just like mm -hmm. always needing to practice. And um, so, uh, yeah, I, I would say it depends on the situation too, how much, you know, you use the empathic listening. But this, uh, so another component actually I didn't mention is the vision of this uh, project is to have an, uh, a culture of empathy. So, and I'll bring that in, you know, in future meetings that the intention is we want to create a culture of empathy. So it can be a culture of empathy with between us here, a culture of empathy in your classrooms, you know, a culture of empathy in the family. So thinking of a larger culture and how do we do cultural transformation? And uh, so we'll be, you know, delving into that maybe at the, in, the, in the next, um, you know, in future uh, meetings. But to get the ball rolling, I'll introduce you to the, what we call the empathy circle, which is kind of the main, one of the main practices we'll be doing. And so this is, a, I had sent a link, I don't know if you had a chance to look at it on the website, it was a bit of an introduction to the empathy circle. And the empathy circle, it kind of got, it's the basics of, you know, a Carl Rogers or Marshall Rosenberg of, of, you know, listening to someone and doing reflective listening. But this is doing it in a group. So we have shared mutual empathic listening. So uh, what I find is a group, having a group of three to five participants uh, is a good amount. You know, sometimes if you get too many people, you know, people don't have a chance to share and then you get kind of bored, like, oh, I want to speak and I want to be engaged. If it's too few, you don't, you don't have a lot of uh, a variety of insights, you know, different perspectives. So, you know, three to five seems to be a good amount. I, I personally like four is kind of like an I ideal amount. So in this process, uh, the first person is going to select who they will speak to. Uh, so I could say I, I, I choose uh, Demetra. And uh, you know, you, I would speak for, uh, we can set a time limit to three to five minutes. We can start with the time limit of five, just to begin with. 
And you know, you can kind of scale the times from three, five, or no time limit, but I find just getting started uh, five minutes is a good amount. And so uh, the speaker uh, selects who they're gonna speak to, they can speak about, we're gonna be talking about the topic of the book, uh, starting with the preface, or anything you wanna speak about. And then this, you speak and then the listener reflects back their understanding of what they have heard until the speaker feels that they've heard been heard to their, under, to their uh, satisfaction or until the time runs out. And then uh, once the speaker has been heard, then uh, it's the listener's turn to become the speaker and they select who they're going to speak to. And that person reflects back what they're hearing and uh, in this, uh, and then so it just rotates for the time allotted. So we're actually just practicing that uh, empathic, you know, listening with each other. And you know, everybody kind of monitors and sticks to the, you know, to the process. We kind of agree to kind of hold that. And the time we goes for the time we keep going for the time allotted. And some tips for the speaker. This is like just a very basic process that. Uh, the speaker, as a speaker, you want to pause often to give the listener a chance to reflect. So if you're speaking, you know, for three or four minutes, it's really hard for this, the listener to be able to reflect back with their understanding. And then when you're the speaker and you feel like you don't have anything else to say and it's, you want to, you know, say you're complete, you can just say, I feel fully heard or something like that, just to indicate that you're done speaking. And then for the uh, active listener or reflector, uh, so in your own words, you're just reflecting back the essence of what you're hearing the person say. So you can, you know, totally parrot it or you can just summarize or paraphrase or just even just get the core essence, ideally the core essence of what the person is saying and reflect that back. And it's an ongoing, you know, learning process. We just get better with it in time. And so, uh, as the listener, you don't want to ask questions, even clarifying questions. You just reflect back to the best of your ability, you know, what you're hearing. You're not like judging. You might be judging in your head, saying, This is totally crazy. That's fine. You know, it's sometimes you can't help whatever is coming, you know, but you try not to. You just try to really listen, reflect back. You know, you try not to analyze you know, not withdraw, diagnose, advise, or sympathy. So these are kind of blocks to empathy. You're just trying to turn your attention to the speaker and just hear what they have to say and reflect back your understanding to the satisfaction of the speaker for them to really feel heard, uh, that they really feel that they've been heard. And um, sometimes the speaker will kind of go on and on. And it's like, oh my goodness, I'm feeling all anxious here. Like, I'll never remember all this. And, and so you can say, oh, oh, wait a minute, you know, let me just reflect back what I'm hearing so far. So it's okay, you know, to kind of interrupt like that. And uh, so uh, for the silent listeners, you know, there's a speaker and the listener, then there's their silent listeners who are just sort of observing. So you just kind of patiently, you know, watch and listen and, uh, eventually that your turn will come and you'll have a, you know, a chance to uh, listen and then to uh, speak as well. And um, so you can, with this process, this is like the core minimal, easy, you know, quickly, you know, start with empathic listening. And we can really do a lot with this basic, you know, just practice, you know, just practicing, practicing. It's really, there's a lot we can do with this. It's just, it seems to be the core first step. And, you know, with this, we can go into a lot of other processes and we'll be kind of building on this uh, as we go uh, along um, with, uh, you know, from week to week. So that's, that's there any kind of questions before we get the best thing is, yeah, any questions or comments before we start? Okay, so then what we want to talk about, we setting a topic. Our topic is, is uh, the preface, to talk about the preface. And I'm going to just give a quick review of the preface so that we kind of remember. <clears throat> so 
So the uh, preface was, uh, he starts off by saying, are you a good listener? Says there's many problems in the world and you know, we really need empathy and we're hardwired for empathy. So that was, and I had some questions here, you know, where did you learn to listen? Uh, uh, what is your definition of empathy? He kind of mentions the, I think a definition of empathy and uh, what is an example when you learned or grew in your empathy and why is empathy in society needed now? So these are just some questions related to the, to that chapter. So, um, so with that, we can just step into discussing, so you can, so with, we have our topic, but you can always talk about whatever is alive in you too. If it's like that we have this topic of the preface, but you're like, oh, I've got problems with this person I'm dealing with, and it's just like a burning issue. Feel free to speak about anything that you that you feel is alive for you. Um, oh, we lost uh, Stefan. Maybe he's having some technical. There you go. Be back. So we could get started, and I can sort of I can model it if someone wants to speak to me, and I'll reflect back just to sort of model it um, and you have five minutes so let me bring up a stopwatch just what were the speak. questions again that oh, you yeah. have they were yeah you can just oh you just want they were uh where did you learn to listen uh what is your definition of empathy what is an example when you learned or grew in your empathy and why is empathy needed in society? So these were kind of questions kind of uh, pulled from the preface. You wanted us to use these to- You don't have to. I, this was just to remind everybody what the, you can speak about whatever you want about the preface and you're totally free. These are just to jog everybody's memory so we kind of remember what, what was in the preface. Well, I'm ready to start talking if you Okay, want to and let me uh, set, we got set, <laughs> and start, you got five minutes. And I'll, I'll reflect back to model. Okay, um, well, I, I, I really enjoyed the first chapter in uh, William Miller's book. Um, and I really liked the quote that he uh, began with because it happens to be my favorite book. Uh, to Kill a Mockingbird. Okay, so I'm um, hearing that uh, the the quote you really liked his quotes, the Kill a to Kill a Mockingbird, because that's like your favorite book. And um... yeah, yes. Um, so I, I, it brought me back uh, to the tenth grade uh, when I was in high school, and uh, it was the first time I had read Harper Lee's uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. And uh, the, the, the quote that uh, William Miller uh, uh, has here is, you never really understand another person until you consider things from his point of view, until you climb inside of his skin and walk around in it. It's a powerful quote. Um, and if you've read uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, um, I think I, I can really appreciate it now in a different way than I probably did uh, when I was back in high school reading that book. Uh, of course, the, the, the backdrop uh, for that uh, book is, uh, you know, really, uh, you know, a, a murder, I believe, and, you know, uh, it involves, uh, you know, elements of, uh, you know, racism uh, and, uh, you know, uh, a bias and, uh, uh, and uh, trying to, uh, uh, and judgment and, you know, uh, coming to uh, uh, conclusions very quickly uh, that, you know, it was a black person who, who killed, uh, killed the person. Um, Yes, I'm, what I'm hearing is that it was uh, very, this uh, book, you had read it when you were in the 10th grade and it had a real impact on you. It dealt with some issues like judgment and bias and racism. And so it dealt with a lot of uh, maybe like powerful uh, 
issues and it really made an impact on you. And it's even that that even now you're still have had an impact. Um, yes. Um, well, you know, uh, for example, we recently had uh, we had a situation at the hospital here um, where a uh, without getting into detail, a staff member called a uh, patient. Uh, a uh, derogatory uh, term uh, related to race. And uh, we were, you know, we went around the, in a leadership meeting discussing, you know, uh, how to manage this. Uh, you know, uh, is it just uh, uh, that we should tell people this is, you know, unac unacceptable, unacceptable, and, you know, this, this is, requires uh, punishment, uh, you know, or, uh, you know, I, I, I took a different uh, uh, route and, uh, and suggested that uh, we needed uh, to train staff uh, in empathy and uh, compassion. Uh, sometimes it's called trauma-informed care. Um, and uh, I think it's related uh, to uh, empathy because trauma-informed care is recognizing that people have uh, been traumatized and that, that, that there are ways that you can speak to people that can, uh, that can cause them uh, to be re-traumatized. And there are ways that you can uh, treat people that uh, allow them to, um, you know, to respond uh, with their best selves. Uh, and from a from a different from a different place. Um, okay, let me see if I get this. That uh, so there was uh, an incident uh, at at your facility there where someone called uh, a patient called one of the uh, staff uh, a derogatory racial name. The opposite way. Oh, the opposite. The opposite. Oh, so it's the opposite. A staff member called a patient a uh, derogatory term, and that. Uh, that they, everybody was talking about what the staff was talking about. What do we do about this? And you know, should there be punishment or you know judgment or whatever? And you're wanting to take a whole different approach, which was a more empathic way of of teaching uh, of these empathic methods, and uh, and that relates to some of the practices that you're familiar with, trauma informed care, and some other practices that are more empathy based. And so that was what you were proposing. Uh, as a way of addressing this uh, issue. And that was the yeah. time, the five minutes too. It, did you feel, okay, you feel heard enough? Is that? Yeah. Okay, then great. Then uh, I'll speak to uh, Ingrid. Yes. Um, so yeah, um, I'm really enjoying uh, Stefan's uh, uh, story. And what I imagine is uh, for the training within the facility, is that the staff would have learned to do empathy circles, right? They would have had empathy circles with each other, as well as that that uh, even the the patients or the could be doing empathy circles. So I, I envision an environment where there's people doing empathy. Everybody's kind of learning that the, it's not just the staff, but it's the patients as well. And that when there is a conflict, like he's talking about that they would have an empathy circle with each other to talk it out, so. So what I, um, what I think I heard you say is that you got pretty excited when you heard Stefan talk about his, uh, his story, what happened, and that you had, in, you had um, like a vision that the staff could do, it's a way to apply the empathy circles, the staff could do empathy circles, and even the patients also could do empathy circles and then you could maybe even have them do empathy circles between the patients and the staff too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like sort of a conflict mediation yeah. sort of approach that, yeah. So um, anyway, I heard, I heard a lot of excitement about yeah. applying uh -huh. um, the empathy circle as a possible tool in his situation. And to be learning these skills before the conflict. So I think before the conflict, they would even head off a large percentage of potential conflict, as well as taking it into the families, like right, the staff could be doing it with their families, and even the patients can be doing it with their families. So you can 
uh, sort of spread it. That's kind of the culture of empathy is bringing it, you know, bef you know before, during, and after all these different uh, things happen. Wow. So what, um, what it sounds like is that some more thoughts came in and it was like the um, having it preventative. If they do it, mm -hmm. it can prevent this from happening and it can, it just can spread. It can spread out for with the staff does it with their own family, patients do it with their family. And um, it gets excite exciting when you think about how it can just spread by doing that. The culture yeah. of empathy. Yeah, exactly. It, it, so one is having the the uh, vision that we have the aim, the vision of a culture of empathy as sort of a container of what we're working towards, and that's what we have in in this group is we want to build a culture of empathy. So we kind of start with the sort of intention. Us. Ah, so it, with even with this group, it's important for us to start with this culture of empathy intention. Yeah, and uh, that's also for the uh, curriculum, the training, uh, the, the MOOC is to create a tool set that anyone could use like that, that, that the patients could use it in their home with their family. They could come even before they had come, you know, they could be doing this or the, the staff. And so just kind of really spreading this. And that's what we'd really like to develop is a easy to use tool that anyone can, uh, you know, learn, learn these skills learn and practice these skills yeah so something that's really accessible to everyone yeah um, who, who wants it and needs it they can use it uh -huh. so yeah it's the intention so it's a great story to kind of a real life story that kind of jump into so yeah mm -hmm. I feel heard thank you so it helped me see your vision too having you share that mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so you're seeing the vision that's that, that by sharing that, having that story for me, building on it, then you could kind of uh, get a sense of the vision. So, yes. Yeah. So I feel heard if you want to. And, and also, when we go around, it's nice to kind of select someone who hasn't spoken to, but you don't have to you have a choice of selecting whoever you want. So it's your turn to select who you would like to speak. It's my turn. Mm hmm. Um, so it doesn't, I guess I would, so we, we can, okay, um, I don't know for sure what to say. Um, when I looked at what you said about the uh, the first step, the first step is to, oh, I have to pick. Yeah. And then whatever you say, they'll reflect back. Yeah. Okay. I'll pick, um, Dimitri. So, um, it's kind of like, oops, I can't hear you again. I'm um, sorry, I said it's Dimitra. <laughs> Dimitra, thank you. Yeah, excellent. Dimitra. I apologize for that. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> um, I'm not really sure where to start. Um, when I think about the preface, one thing it said in there was that not, um, I was trying to pull it up here on my phone, that not very many, but he said that it's something that we all have. What were the exact words? Something um, we're born with to do this, mm -hmm. but then that very few people do it. So I'm curious about why that is, if it's something we're born with. And one thing I've kind of thought before was that maybe with, um, and Dr. Carlson may know this, I, thought, I was thinking like maybe it's secure attachment people who maybe have more skills in this than people who aren't securely attached. Um, but anyway, so that's a curiosity I have that he brought up in the, um, in the preface. And I'll stop there. Okay, so Ingrid, uh, uh, what you said was that uh, the thing that really attracted your attention from the preface was that you read that some people, that it, people are born with this uh, capability, but it seems that only a few of them can really develop it. And you were you are wondering if this has to do with their childhood and their previous experiences that have uh, helped them to develop it even more in contrast to some other people who cannot do it. And so it uh, remains idle at some point and they cannot, yeah. uh, it cannot increase. Yes, that's right. And then the other thing um, 
had to do with the definition of empathy. Um, I think it gets really confusing with the definition of empathy. Some people think that it's that I can't remember the person who wrote that book, the case against empathy. And when I read it, I didn't read the whole thing, but when I started reading it, I thought, Oh, well, he defines it very differently than I do. Um, and so, then it was like, okay, well, I can see where he's getting to where he is because it's, it's a different definition. And so I don't really see it as, um, I don't have to feel what the other person is feeling. Um, I can un maybe understand if that's possible, but I don't have to feel it. And so that's, that's an enough. <laughs> Okay, so what you said was that uh, you were a little confused uh, about how we can define the concept of empathy, and you used to give a definition in your mind. But when you read the when you read the book, the case against empathy, you saw that the writer uh, gave a different definition. But later on, you realized that. Um, it's okay if you give it if you define it in a different way uh, and the point is that when you show empathy it does not necessarily mean that you have to experience the same thing you can or have the same feelings it's enough if you can understand the feelings of the other person yeah that's right so i feel heard thank you <laughs> thank you too <laughs> so so it's now your turn and you select who you want to speak to and we just continue for the time allotted for another about okay. 40 minutes can i can i talk about whatever to yeah about whatever you want to whoever you want okay uh i can talk to stefan and uh, okay, uh, I read okay, I read the book, but what I have in my mind is something uh, that happened on this uh, Friday. And on this Friday, I had my birthday. And also on this Friday, I heard that my favorite chef uh, committed suicide. And I'm referring to um, Anthony Bourdain, if I pronounce his name well. And actually, Anthony Bourdain was the only chef I really liked and he could really uh, keep me sitting on my couch to watch uh, about um, you know culinary things and all even though I like to cook but he was the only one so when I heard about that I was very shocked especially when I heard about how he he did this uh, he took his life and I really was very shocked so um, you, you had a mixture of feelings <laughs> on your birthday. Yeah. Uh, you had some positive emotions about being, it being your birthday on Friday, and that also coincided with you discovering, um, you know, uh, something negative, a shock, a, 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 a shock value of, of Anthony Bourdain committing suicide and the particulars of how he did it, of, of, of someone that you, uh, you know, really respected, enjoyed, um, uh, you know, even though you're not particularly fa uh, a fan of uh, chefs and things, he, he, he has had garnered your attention and uh, so you were, you were dealing with having these different emotions on your on your birthday right and uh, today uh, one of my students uh, came over to my place and we had a discussion about this event this sad event and she asked me but he was so successful how could he do this and I told her that you know what success is something that I mean it's a relative thing and we might look successful but our heart does not necessarily mean that it's full of love or uh, other positive feelings that give meaning in our life. So, we, we, of course, I'm the last person whom I know what happened in the background, but many people seem to be very depressed when they 
don't have real love and support in their lives and money or fame cannot really make any difference when your heart is cold. So uh, your friend came over and... Uh, and uh, Yeah, my student. Yeah, your student, I'm sorry. And yes, okay. uh, he was, ex or he or she was expressing this uh, common, uh, you know, kind of thought that, uh, you know, boy, I mean, uh, why, you know, this guy, why, why did he commit suicide? I mean, he was wealthy and had everything seemingly going for him. And, and, and you, you pointed out that, uh, you know, that, that, that these external, uh, this external picture that people have of, of others, uh, is, uh, not always, uh, what's going on underneath and uh and you particularly believe that uh, love and uh, really important uh to feeling whole and uh, he was missing out on something like that even though he had everything else seemingly right and Absolutely, and it's not only about him that he happened to be famous, but also about other people who are not so famous, and they seem to feel so empty, and they end up being so seriously depressed, and you probably know it more than me, right, because it's part of your job, <laughs> and um, that it seems that people uh, don't find any meaning in their life, and this also, the lack of empathy, seems to affect their overall physical condition. So when the heart is empty, the, bo the body suffers too. And so we had this kind of discussion about the increasing rate of uh, suicide, the suicide rate, the increased suicide rate. In I told you, you know, in the States, I've read studies that people commit suicide more and more. And she said, oh, you know what? The same happens in Greece. I said, oh, <laughs> I hadn't read about this study actually, but the news is very bad. So I, I had this in my mind all day and I, I'm, very, I'm very concerned about what is going on and about the quality of human relationships in nowadays. Okay, um, that was a complicated uh, statement you uh, really? just made there. And uh, you, you said some things that I wanted to clarify with you, if it's okay. Um, mm -hmm. I heard you say um, that, a lack, uh, that lacking empathy may play a role in developing uh, perhaps a mental illness that would lead to suicide and uh, were you saying that maybe um, Anthony Bourdain uh, or, uh, let me say this in a way that's not exactly a, a question but uh, did I hear you say did I hear you that Anthony Bourdain uh, doesn't have meaning or empathy in his life, which may have played a role in his suicide. I don't know if, I, if So can I answer? That was the five minutes though. So we'll, we'll if, uh, if we, we, t we can move on, it'll come back around. So you can bring it up again in the next time, just to kind of stay on the five minutes. So. You can kind of hold that and maybe it'll surface. Um, so, or, yeah, uh, Stefan, if you want to speak, you can actually speak back to her if you want. If you, so you can choose anyone to speak to, but it's your turn. Well, I have so many things. Um, well, there are different ways to categorize uh, empathy. Uh, First, who are you speaking to? I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I, I was just going to follow the same train, uh, but uh, I, I'll. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll speak to Dim uh, Dimitra. Uh, um, I, I got confused by your statement, um, honestly. Uh, and uh, while I was uh, uh, supposed to be providing empathic listening, <laughs> I was disagreeing with what you were saying in a sense, if I understood you correctly. Uh, 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 
you know, honestly, because I, I, I find, uh, or at least in my experience, I found Anthony Bourdain, and I think you do too, honestly, probably, my guess is you do, uh, that he's an incredibly, uh, that, he, that he is an incredibly empathic person, and, 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 and he found a lot of meaning in life. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, so I just wonder what, if, if you could comment, uh, uh, on what okay. I'm, on my, on, on my grasp <laughs> of what you were saying. At first, just reflecting. Yes, first. <laughs> so it seems that my previous comment has seriously confused you and you couldn't really uh, listen to me the way you had planned to listen <laughs> because you were shocked. <laughs> And also, you say that you have met you had met Anthony. And I'm not sure if you know, but you say that you might you have met people like him. I'm not sure that I uh, really understood this point. And you said that Anthony was uh, um, had a lot of empathy. And if I'm not wrong, you also said that he had found meaning in his life through his uh, profession. Um, well, I haven't met Anthony, uh, nor do I think I need to have met Anthony in person uh, to make uh, the, the statement that um, from what, just watching his uh, series, Parts Unknown, on CNN, um, I, I feel that, uh, you know, that the way that he viewed life uh, the way his, his his statements, the things that he said about life, uh, uh, demonstrated to me uh, that um, there were many uh, there were many things that he had found meaningful in life, and um, and also that um, and and I saw him over and over again in many interactions uh, demonstrate powerful empathy. Uh, toward a variety of different people. Okay, so I, again, I'm gonna do the reflective, and I had. Uh, can I have the chance at some point to answer, just to clarify the uh, misunderstanding? Uh, once it's your turn. Oh, when it's my turn. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, okay, Stefan. Uh, from what you said, I, I understand that uh, you believe that uh, Anthony had. Uh, a meaningful life because he did uh, he he kept himself very busy by doing things that um, were not superficial so they had meaning and uh, he was an empathetic person and um, this is what I remember sorry uh, I don't know if I forgot something well the first part wasn't really accurate uh, I, I I didn't say that um, he had a meaningful life because of his job or uh, it was it was it, we, we know another person we know their life we know their their inner workings of their mind uh, only one way by communication and by listening and by hearing what people say and how and their body language and I believe that uh, having watched uh, Parts Unknown over several years, uh, that uh, Anthony Bourdain demonstrated that he had found uh, meaning uh, in life in a number of areas, and uh, and and time and time again in his show, uh, he uh, interacted with uh, people who were. Uh, suffering, who were in pain, who were vulnerable, uh, weak, struggling with revolution and uh, uh, economic uh, 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 problems, discrimination, etc. And he, uh, and he, to me, demonstrated a great deal of empathy. Mm -hmm. So, uh, as you said, uh, I didn't really go the first part, but you explained that. Uh, the main way we can learn, we can really, um, yeah, um, 
learn about a person is through uh, listening to the person and all, also through the body language. And after watching Anthony for many years uh, through his uh, successful TV series, you think that he had a meaningful life and he also cared about people who were in, uh, who were in need. And uh, so, yeah, in other words, you, you feel that he was a person with empathy and he had found meaning in his life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Can I? Is it now okay you can now? speak to whoever you want. You can select. <laughs> okay, then I, I need to clarify something to Stefan. And, you can also um, speak to others and get a reflection from them about your. <laughs> you want to kind of spread it around a little bit. So, but, but you, it is your choice. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, okay, then I will choose Ingrid. And I'll say that uh, it seems that, uh, first of all, I want to say that I was very delighted when Seven to- uh, talked about the, the book because I happen to have the book here. Because on Friday, I'm making a presentation <laughs> of his book. And I just love it so much. And the quote that we find at the beginning of the... Sorry, I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, the quote we find at the beginning of the first chapter is that the signature, I always have the automatic signature I have at, my, at the end of my email. So uh, this about skin is something I totally love. <laughs> yes? So I it's... it's What I heard you say is um, that it was, uh, you were surprised by um, when when you read the book and you saw that quote in the book. And then also when Stefan mentioned it today, because you you love or you have To Kill a Mockingbird right there where you are right now. And it's also your signature on your email. Is that correct? Absolutely. Uh, and uh, it seems that we had a little misunderstanding with Stefan. And uh, actually, what I said was not that uh, uh, Anthony did not have empathy. On the contrary, I, I wanted to say that he had a lot. And I, I personally, I'm extremely attracted to people who have empathy. They're like a magnet to me. I, mean, I just need it. It's a quality that I cannot live without. So I think that. Uh, even though, of course, I didn't know the person, okay, uh, I just enjoyed his TV shows and his his per- TV personality, um, that he had empathy, he seemed to be sensitive, very friendly, no arrogant, I didn't receive this, uh, uh, never gave me this impression. But I think, and from what I have read, it seems that people who, whose empathy is quite high, they have a hard time in their life because others do not share the same quality. So after some years, I'm not talking about Anthony, of course, but it seems that people have a hard time and at some point they might, not all of them, of course, they might end up being depressed because of the lack of real communication. They cannot identify with the others. So um, what, I, what I think I'm hearing you say is that you were really surprised that Stefan, um, how Stefan interpreted what you said, because you thought you said that um, you felt um, Anthony Bourdain had a lot of empathy. And somehow there was some communication mix up with what, what he heard and that you are drawn to empathic people very much. So you need them in your lives and you really enjoyed him. Um, and with him being an empathic person, that's one reason why you were kind of drawn to him. And, um, and then I think you also talked about at the end is that, um, how, Sometimes people who are really empathic, they can maybe, because they're so empathic, they may not have as many other connections because um, it's harder for them to connect with others because other people aren't as empathic. Wasn't exactly sure if I, um, if I heard you correctly with that. Mm-hmm. Uh, do I have some more time, Edwin? 
Yes, one minute. Okay, yes, Ingrid, you're very close to what I said. Um, uh, it seems that the empathic people want to tend to want to have meaningful uh, connections with others and they care and they are givers, uh, but when they don't you know it's like bicycle we need both feet to move in order for the bicycle to cover some distance so let's say that if i care about you once twice 20 times and i uh, um, what i receive is just a, a cold uh, uh, reaction from let's say for example your part at some point i've people Oops. might suffer because of this okay so um it's something to clarify i think you're saying that um empathic people they also they're giving a lot and they right. also need to receive and that if they don't receive enough that that can maybe um cause problems uh, that's not exactly what you said, but it's something something like that. Yes, right. They might feel ex extremely disappointed. Disappointed, that's right. Right. But yeah, but this is not for 100% of people, of course, yes. but it seems that many people who commit suicide, if we take a look at their past and who they were, they tend to be sensitive people who take life seriously, who just, you know, they they are not superficial in their interactions that's five minutes um, and that you, you've also commented that people who in your belief that who um, commit suicide are, um, are are sensitive people and um, I'm kind of getting overload <laughs> I, can't, I can't remember um, well, we could oh. that we was a five minutes too so. okay so anyway, that they're very people who commit suicide are very typically very uh, maybe uh, very sensitive um, people as well. Yes. <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now I oh it's my turn. It's your turn. Now we just keep going for. Okay, so Edwin, I'll talk with you. Okay. And I found it really interesting um, about Dim Dimitra. Did I pronounce Excellent. it correctly? Perfect. Th about her bringing up Anthony Bourdain, um, because it's you know I've read his first book and I've always enjoyed him as well, and yet there really isn't anyone I have talked to about it, um, about him passing, and it's just it's just I'm, it's like. Um, I just, it's so shocking, and here I don't even know him. And then I think about how he did it, and it's just, um, I don't under, I just don't understand all of it. And okay, anyway. so I'm hearing that you're, you found it interesting that Dimitra brought up uh, Bourdain's his suicide, and you haven't had a chance to really talk about it with anyone. And is this your kind of just sitting with, the, it's a little noisy here, sorry the garbage truck uh, and uh, you're just sort of sitting with it and just how he did it and just haven't had a, really a chance to sort of work through it and share yes. about it. That's, that's right. So it helps to hear you talk about it. Um, and both, um, both of you talk a little bit about it to hear your perspectives and even on the empathy and, and hearing that discussion. So you're finding it uh, helpful to have a discuss to hear uh, others talk about Bourdain and what was happening. So you're kind of able to kind of process it a bit, as well as these other topics uh, around the uh, empathy. And that's, you know, I guess, it's like like a con it's con contrib contributing to you to yes, be able yes. to hear that. Yes. So thank you. So I have three minutes. So is there more? Um. I don't think so. I'm fine. Um, okay, then um, I'll speak to uh, Dimitra and uh, 
So what's come up for me is uh, Ingrid mentioned um, uh, definitions. And I think that's always a real big problem in the work that we're doing here is how are we defining empathy? What do we mean by empathy? So it, it's, a, it's a big uh, topic and issue that somehow we need to be able to address that clearly, I think, for creating a training. Okay, when you mentioned that uh, earlier, Ingrid told, uh, talked about the different definitions about empathy and you find it important for us to clarify a little bit uh, what we mean when we use this term. Yeah, for example, with uh, the Against Empathy book is about four years ago when the author uh, wrote, you know, wrote his first article in the New Yorker about Against Empathy, the first thing I did is I emailed him and I said, uh, I would like to empathize with you against about why you're against empathy. <laughs> would you do an online kind of an interview so I can kind of empathize with you? And uh, he kind of just brushed me off. He just, he, uh, at first he said he would do it. And then I don't know, maybe he saw that I knew what I was talking about because I had done a lot with empathy. And then he just wouldn't talk to me. He just kind of like, yeah. Okay, so when you first uh, saw that the the new book about a uh, title, the case against no, no, it, no, mm -hmm. it was when it, when his first article came out. Oh yeah, article four, yes. four years ago. Okay, uh, you took the initiative to send an email to the writer, and you you express your willingness to empathize with the person. And even though the person in the first place uh, was positive, uh, later on you never heard from him, and probably he realized that you were very well aware of the topic, and he uh, didn't want to uh, contact you. Yeah, I'm just making that up. I don't know if he's, I've had, inter I've been for four years, for over four years, I've been trying to get him to do a recorded dialogue about it. And he's, he's from Yale, he's a professor at Yale. And, uh, you know, so he's got a big, he's got that reputation. And uh, so what am I trying to say? So anyway, he wouldn't do a recorded dialogue. I think he's, I'm making all these judgments and assumptions. <laughs> but it's like um, that uh, it was, uh, but he would do it written. He will do written. So I have 20 pages of, uh, of emails of dialogue with him on the topic. And I could not understand what the heck he was talking about. And, and I would tell him about my experiences with doing empathic mediation. He says, that's, that's very successful, but that's not empathy. And I couldn't figure out what the heck he was talking about until I finally got it. For him, empathy is is uh, if you're very if you're very angry, Demetra, you're like jumping up and down, totally angry. And then I see you, I start jumping up and down. I get I'm totally angry, and we're both like jumping up and down, totally angry. And he calls that empathy, you know. So that's and that's what he's criticizing. Okay, so for it seems that for four years you really tried to have this recorded uh, discussion with the person who happens to be a professor at Yale, uh, and uh, as you said, he's quite famous. And uh, but he, uh, the only thing you, he, you did with him was just to exchange pages of emails, and you really, uh, you really had a, had a hard time to re to make out what he really meant by using this term. And after uh, uh, <laughs> a big effort, you finally got it. And that was that probably a sense of mirroring, a mirrored feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? exactly. That uh -huh. you do something and the other person does exactly the same thing. And uh, this, is what, this is what he, he uh, meant when he used this term. Exactly. And then, so we're talking about two different things. And what he is talking about, actually, I see as a block to empathy. Because if, for me to listen to you when you're angry, I listen to you, you're angry, I stay present with you, 
I hear what's behind the anger. You know, if I go deeper and deeper into your experience, why you're angry, what it means to you. And for me, that is empathy to feel into your experience and accompany you. And what he's talking about actually blocks empathy. So it, it's just so confusing with all these different definitions. And, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's frustrating. Okay, it seems that uh, it really bothered you, this uh, confusion caused by the multiplicity of terms. On the one hand, you understand that empathy is when you, when the person experiences a, a particular feeling. Empathy for you is when you listen actively and when you pay full attention to the person and you share the feelings. And so you are there, you're totally present. Uh, but what he thinks is just like mirroring the same thing. That, I mean, you just replicate the feeling the other person experiences and you find it uh, you you believe that you strongly believe that this makes no sense and has the opposite result instead of uh, showing compassion just blocks the communication yeah it's it's not compassion i didn't say the compassion part because i usually don't say that but the rest was was accurate i feel hurt <laughs> that's for the compassion part <laughs> okay thank you thank you so we continue. We continue for the time allotted. <laughs> yep. Uh, whose turn is? You can speak to whoever you want. Oh, my turn. Your turn. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I would like to talk to Ingrid. Uh, I want to mention two things that attract my attention. Um, the first was that when one of the uh, first uh, Ingrid, Ingrid, one of the first questions you asked Edwin today was if he practices uh, empathic listening in, he, in all his everyday interactions. And this was so, really turned my attention because this was one of the things I, act, I, I asked Edwin when I first started, I mean, <laughs> a, a week ago. <laughs> and actually, I, asked, I told him that it was not in the form of a question, but more of a statement that, you know, empathy for me is a situation that you should always practice. It's not some, okay, you know, now I want to talk with uh, Ingrid because she happens to be my friend. But you know what? After 30 minutes, after this session is over, you know, I don't really care about you because now I'm busy. So this is not really... Um, this could not describe, um, if I treat my, my friend like that, uh, I will not be described as an empathetic person, but probably as a person who, has, uh, who knows how to practice this skill whenever I want to activate this, um, uh, how can I say, this uh, option, uh, this ability. So what, um, it sounds like when you heard me ask that question, you kind of... Uh, it was kind of humorous to you because you had asked Edwin the very, very similar question to him mm -hmm. and how you see, um, how you see it, the answer to that question, the answer to that question is that it's, you really have an, um, an empathetic, empathetic, empathetic presence to you uh, or with people all the time. Um, it's not something you turn on or turn off. Um, so I see you, you have a questioning. Your face looks like I'm getting <laughs> some of it wrong. <laughs> so help clarify it for me. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure that I, I was clear enough. So uh, what I said was that if somebody has empathy, that this is a skill that you have 24-7. I mean, this is how you are. But of course, as we had discussed with Stephen the previous week, this is a skill that it, uh, it develops, okay? Uh, some people uh, might start from, let's say they, have, they are 40% empathetic listeners and then they uh, take it up to 70 or 80%. Some other people might start from 80% or some people might start from 5%. So it depends uh, uh, on our uh, experiences, on who knows what are the factors. But it's something that we cultivate. But I think that when we have it, we just have it. If I'm 40% yeah. empathetic, empathetic listener, then I am like this more or less every day of my life, more or less. 
So how you see it is people have different um, skill levels with empathy, um, like 40%, 50%, or, you know, 80%. And then if they have that percentage, that's about what you could guess how often they're empathic with people other when they're in communicating with other people. So it's, it's not that they can't really be at a hundred percent because their skill level isn't at a hundred percent. Is mm-hmm. that, is, am I yes. on, on the right path? Yeah. Yes. So if, if you are, you are. Yes. If, if you are you're correct, if you are empathic, you are empathic, but not all people are empathic all the time. Is yes. That, okay. I guess maybe I said that and you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but do you, do you feel heard? Yes, I think, uh, yes. But do I have some more time or not? Edwin, do I have? 20 seconds. Oh, it's not enough for a statement. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to save my time for next time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, Ingrid? Um, I'm trying to think of what I want to talk about. I'll, I'll pick um, Stefan. Did I say that correct? Okay. Yeah. How, can and, I just ask, how do I cancel my video? Real quick um, so you, uh, there's on the bottom, there's the, the mute and then stop video. And if you just click the stop video, it'll turn off your video. So if I stop video, I can still hear. Uh, you just can't. Yeah. 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 I, just want to, I just want to have better reception. Can you still hear me? We, see, we hear yes. you. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Great. Okay. I'm, I'm looking at you, um, uh, Ingrid. I just, okay. sorry. Okay. Um, so it was interesting just talking with uh, Demetra about it because I think like my goal is like now I have to work at it. I have to work at being empathic, I feel, you know, and I'm, and my goal is for it to just be natural, you know, that I, it's like, I don't even know I'm doing it. And I am, you know, it's, and I think it's going to take me a long time to get there, but I can see signs where it, it, it does happen at times when I don't know I'm doing it, but um, that's my, that's my goal. Anyway, go, I'm done with that. Okay. So, uh, you know, part, part of your desire uh, is the, to you just have um, this um, empath empathy uh, happen unconscious unconsciously, uh, and not to have, not to have to work at it uh, in, uh, uh, in a so con- so consciously as as you are feel that you are frequently now uh, you feel like you have a, you put a lot of effort and and conscious uh, attention on getting it right and and being empathic and you wish that it uh would just kind of uh flow more naturally on a on a more kind of kind of unconscious level requires uh work on your part did i get that yes. right yeah that that's correct and it's um it's not it's it, and I'm curious, do you, does everyone here, do you have to work at it or does it come, um, is it something that you have to think about when you're with people? Do you have to think, okay, I need to listen or is, does it, do you just do that? Mm-hmm. So you're, you're, uh, you're, you're just, uh, wandering aloud, um, uh... To, yeah. With our group, yeah. I mean, I'm wondering if the three of you, what your what the experience is like for you. You're really wanting to ask a question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. If I can. The three of us. Uh, but I guess maybe you can answer it some other time if you if you desire to. So, I'm just curious about the, the learning and that how people, different people go about learning to become empathic or reflect or with the listening too. you know, both of those. And I think understanding that will help us with the course as well. 
And so I'm done. So, uh, you know, you're, you're, so you're wondering uh, about, uh, do, de do definitions matter? And, uh, you know, and what definitions are, are we going uh, to use here uh, in our, as we move forward, uh, both uh, for this training and this course uh, on, on distinguishing between impassion and, uh, you know, and, and what that means for the practice, or does it mean anything for the practice? Is that right? Well, I don't remember saying anything about <laughs> definitions, but I do believe definitions do matter. <laughs> and I like that Edwin brought it up because I, with all the courses I've worked on in my life, I tell you, definitions are critical. Getting them hammered out, you know, early on. Sometimes they morph, you know, they change. Sometimes you have to say, this is what we think the word means, but we're not, it's not concrete, but agreeing to that as you go forward. So I'm done, complete. Ha having some, uh, having some ground, ground rules uh, is uh, important for uh, structuring uh, a conversation, uh, an, uh, an adventure, a, uh, a, a venture. Kinda. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry. I guess I, I wasn't very, I, I'm I, having difficulty with my connection. I apologize. Okay. I apologize. Okay. I'm having I'm having some connection problem. I may be missing part of what you are uh, trying to say. Okay. Okay, so you were heard to enough. I, I, I was heard enough, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so, Stefan? Um, it's your turn to select. Okay. Uh, to, uh, <laughs> can you hear me okay now? I do, yeah. Okay. Okay, I'll try it. Uh, uh, have I done, done it with Ingrid? Ingrid yet? Has Ingrid uh, listened to me yet? I I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Just select who you want to select. Okay. Just okay. Yeah. Sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, okay, Ingrid, you ready? Yes. Okay. Um, well, so uh, definitions and all then is, is I can't compassion. There's empathy. There's there's emotional empathy. Uh, I said definitions. There's compassion, there's empathy, there's cognitive empathy, there's emotional empathy. Uh, sometimes there's something called transactional em empathy, relational empathy, uh, instrumental empathy. So there's all these uh, different definitions. And darn, uh, it does get confused for me. So you're there, were you done right? Was that a pause? Okay, yes. <laughs> so there are lots of definitions and you listed a whole slew of different types of words related to empathy that, that um, add to the confusion about uh, what is what. I can't hear you. Yes. yes. Okay. <clears throat> um. Often, uh, you know, uh, people, particularly in the mindfulness uh, uh, world, will uh, talk about uh, passion uh, as being empathy and empathy and action, in a sense, um, um, or um, uh, because it, it, it's more about caring about the feelings. Uh, that a, a person has. Uh, and uh, a lot of people think that empathy is more immediate and, uh, and, uh, and in, in the medical world and in the healthcare field, they talk about um, burnout. And, uh, uh, and, and even 
gets confusing because uh, some say uh, it, it, it's so confusing because people say that empathy actually can improve uh, burnout. Uh, but then they also talk about something <laughs> called uh, compassion fatigue. And they also <laughs> talk about, uh, um, uh, you know, people who are uh, just in, uh, often will, uh, it, it, empathy may be debilitating uh, because uh, it's um, just emoting uh, what the other person is feeling, some pe depending on the way that you define it. You know, uh, so, oh, you know, so I think generally it's divided, empathy is divided, emotional empathy, cognitive empathy, emotional empathy, feeling, sorry. sorry. <laughs> my, my brain can only handle so much <laughs> and, <laughs> and with oh. listening. And um, what, what I heard was that there's a lot of confusion between compassion and empathy and that some people think compassion is action and empathy, both of them, both together. Is that what you said? And, yes. and then it's just not that there's even more, more confusion because there's even like all these other terms and you have um, compassion fatigue. And then even with, and I'm not sure that's the right word you use, the same words, but even they'll say sometimes having empathy can help solve or helps make compassion fatigue a little bit uh, easier to handle or something. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, it's just uh, it's a lot more, um, what I hear you say is a lot more examples of all these with the mindfulness community and everything else, and the medical community. And then you have the, um, you didn't mention the empathy community, but it's kind of like you have all these different disciplines um, defining, having all these different terms that are all kind of related, but also different. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, do I have more time? Uh, you've got 20 seconds. <laughs> uh, now it's 15. <laughs> uh, You're perhaps, down to 10. <laughs> perhaps it neurobiologically. Oh, yes. There's, <laughs> Good luck, Edwin, with defining those Sorry. terms. Uh, okay. So, okay, well, that was great. That was a good start. Uh, this was just kind of getting us kind of getting going. You know, we're not going to do, we're not doing too much in these first couple of meetings, but just kind of practicing this empathic listening. Uh, this interesting that the topic of uh, definitions came up because it is kind of a, maybe it's something that we definitely need to address, you know, for the training. Uh, there's a good uh, paper by Dan Batson, uh, who, uh, wrote a paper called uh, These Things Called Empathy it has eight different definitions, of eight different ways the word empathy is used. And I have a link to it, which I can send mm -hmm. uh, yeah. to it. So it's a, it's a good definition. It's, what he does is he shows the dynamic, two people talking to each other and, and what they're saying and then looking at the different components. So it kind of creates a model uh, for you so you have kind of like a physiological model of two people dialoguing and different components of the dialogue and naming it empathy so it is a, a real problem and uh, the so from a and i'm not quite sure how we would address this almost like we need a separate meeting or almost like several meetings to create a simple definition but the the definition i'm kind of following is the one by Carl Rogers. So Carl Rogers, uh, his is that feeling along with someone, right? That someone is feeling into their experience, kind of being present with it at its, at its core is, uh, so is, if you were angry that I would just follow you in your anger to where it leads. And then, uh, that self-empathy is feeling into my own experience, what are my feelings, 
And then what we're looking at is a culture of empathy, is a relationship of empathy, being aware of those different components, but also that we have a relationship here and there's empathy within the relationship, and I'm calling that a culture of empathy. Mm-hmm. And that's what we're trying to do is we're not, and it, it depends on your perspective. So it's, uh, if we're taking kind of an individualistic perspective, empathy looks one way, but if we look at empathy from a relationship, it has a different quality. You know, it's, it's uh, an empathy deficit. Well, anyway, so it's a whole big topic. Um, and the other component that we're, I'm looking at is what's sometimes called cognitive empathy. I think is a horrible term for it. I would call it imaginative empathy, is that I can feel into your experience, I can feel into my experience. And imaginative empathy is I can take any perspective and feel what it's like from that perspective, kind of like an actor does. You know, uh, Meryl Streep takes on Margaret Thatcher, she kind of feels into that and feels the <laughs> what that feels like. and. Um, so it is a big topic. We'll have to. It's one thing we're going to have to work with. With the uh, uh, and the way I'm looking at handling it is, is that we're trying to create a culture of empathy, and then the components of that culture of empathy. So um, I don't know. It's just any thoughts, any kind of final before we close. Uh, I want to keep us on track here for closing yeah, time. Edwin, uh, I don't think well, that we uh, the, have the other, time um, now. The other ways to oh. break. Oh. No, go, go ahead, Dimitri. I think we got the lag with the. Okay. Uh, I just I would like to discuss next time, if you wish, uh, the. Um, uh, the difference uh, between compassion and empathy because we mentioned a little bit you know during our session today and i would like to learn more about how you how you see compassion in relation to empathy okay. how close they are and how different they are so i'm hearing there's an interest in definitions and also empathy and compassion kind of the relationship between those and uh stefan what stefan what was you were saying Oh, I was, um, I was just saying, uh, um, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's another way to break empathy down into, I think what it's called relational, um, transactional and, um, instrumental empathy. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, relational empathy is kind of like, um, you kind of step into their shoes, get them, and you help another person person construct uh, uh, their, their narrative or their understanding in some way. Transactional empathy is when uh, you're involved in trying to um, help a person uh, uh, Nego- in negotiating certain goals or things, and then um, then instrumental empathy are is often for people who don't have um, self awareness, and and you're helping that person have empathy for themselves by to help them kind of understand uh, themselves and their situation when they themselves cannot articulate it um you um you, you often there are uh, uh people with certain types of personality disorders or uh, um uh, autism or schizophrenia people on less um innate uh kind of empathy for whatever mm-hmm. for whatever genetic biological reason and so you uh with this instrumental empathy, uh, you are helping them um, in different ways uh, with their affect and different things. Okay, so what I'm hearing is there's a variety of, you're seeing, uh, there's, you're kind of adding to the, the pile of <laughs> definitions <laughs> that there's uh, kind of this transactional empathy, relational empathy, and, and you know, some very, there's actually a couple more there. So, you know what I'm, and that each of those has you know there's different meaning associated with each of those. 
So, you know, we're kind of flexible in terms of how we progress on this. And I'm hearing a lot of interest in this definitions. Would you like to, like the next meeting, be about just honing in on the definition of empathy? Would, uh, no, only no, definitions. You, you don't want to deal with definition. <laughs> it's like, let me out of here, no definition. <laughs> Okay. No, I don't want, I, we can have some definitions if the other if the other participants are happy with that but what if we have uh, some definitions and then some uh, uh, empathetic listening and some interesting discussion as we did tonight and the previous time oh it would be the topic would be definitions what we use empathic listening oh I might point. be silent oh, okay so <laughs> Okay, so I'm hearing one vote for no. Um, <laughs> and I'm kind of so, so I think it so, can get so. over, yeah. So, so yeah. Stefan, I'm hearing this, one, this, and Stefan? Well, Steph I mean, uh, I, I, I think it, I think, I think, um, I think, it, you know, I, I don't want to get bogged down. Okay. Because. I can't really hear you. Yeah, anymore. we're we're kind of struggling hearing hearing you. So, I'm uh, sorry. I, I I think I think yes. I think we should talk some about definition. Okay, so we can well, we can continue with our uh, planned this uh, topic. Then uh, keeping on what should be chapter two, because uh, we did preface and chapter one. Uh, this week we'll do chapter two, and if anybody wants to talk about it, uh, definitions, you can bring it up in your time. So because you can talk about anything that you want, and we do have a working definition. The book has a, a working definition, which is uh, an ability to perceive and communicate accurately with sensitivity the feelings of the person and the meanings of those feel of those feelings. So, page one. He, he starts with a, a simple, his simple defin working definition. So um, we, we've got that. Um, so does that, uh, are we, so we're good for next week. We continue with the empathic listening on uh, chapter two then. Okay. Okay. And we'll use the empathic listening and I'll, I'll start bringing in some other activities uh, as well. So like set intention setting and stuff like that. So, okay, then any closing comments? Um, we, I'll send out a survey too for getting feedback. Thank you for, thanks for putting it all together, Edwin. I appreciate all the work that you do. Okay, Demetra, any closing? Thank you very much. I enjoyed the second session. A very meaningful discussion. I'm very happy. I will sleep very happy tonight. <laughs> because it's midnight. Here is midnight. <laughs> uh, oh dear. Oh okay. no. Stefan? Yeah, very nice job. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Okay. I, did I, really, too. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Likewise. Thanks. We'll see you next week then. We'll continue okay. then. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>